I'm going to talk to you about this painting. I didn't make any notes because I thought it should be just like you would be in a gallery. You meet a piece for the first time and you try and understand what the artist is doing. Now, if you were standing right in front of it and you could examine it, you'd find it was a watercolor which in some ways doesn't matter in this case because I suppose I could have painted it in oil or acrylic as opposed to the watercolor, but that's my medium most of the time. What I normally do, um, normally in quotes, is I'm a landscape painter, but many artists have their own approach to painting which they don't necessarily exhibit or it's not um, pushed to the forefront and that's because a lot of the time people I know it sounds funny but they want something to match the couch <laughs> uh, there are others who look at art and images as a progression through all time. So that as an artist, very often you want to make your own special contribution to the way visual arts has gone over the centuries and see that your work is unique or making some kind of statement that you didn't gather from a photograph or somebody else's ideas, just something you've been thinking about or evolving about over your painting career. And this painting here is one of those for my particular stance as an artist. If you look over my shoulder, you can see a typical landscape painting, it's a big one, but you can see that I do do landscape painting. This one is something else. Often because of the nature of reality and how it is explained and how it is very difficult to explain for its true nature, I wonder about the nature of reality and what it really is. So when you view something, how do you decide what a thing is? If I, I am going to use this paintbrush as a pointer. Now, as soon as you look at a paintbrush, you know it's a paintbrush. It takes you just a snap of the fingers to decide that's a paintbrush. Or if you see a jug of milk, two seconds, you know it's a jug of milk. Well, it's not two seconds. It's like such a small fraction of a second whereby you decipher what you're looking at. And I wonder how that happens in your brain. It seems sometimes like it isn't even happening in your brain. It seems to be that you're participating in some ether outside of your brain that is so rapid it's faster than your cat. It just is instantaneous that you will recognize what a visual image is. And actually, you don't need much to tell that. Your brain fills in the dots in no time flat. So if I was just showing just a tiny weeny bit of this brush top, without all this other stuff showing down here, People would decide very quickly, that guy's holding a brush. Your mind just fills in the rest. And, and does it do it from a whole bunch of file cards that it carries in your brain that it flips through to say, well, it's a brush. What kind of brush is it? What kind of hair is it? And how shall I visualize the rest of it? And then it plonks itself on one and says, that's a hog hair brush with a wooden handle very hard to tell how your brain does that. But your brain definitely does decipher 
the reality of forms. It's limited. I mean, if we really study the brain, it's limited because, you know, it's part of your human body and you, you don't have every ability that is necessary to decipher what the universe is about. A lot of it is a mystery because of the limitations of the human body. The way we get around that is with thinking. Thinking is the most important thing that we do. And by thinking, we try to work things out. We're not always sure that we came up with the right answer. But we do think things through. And try and make sense of what we consider to be reality. Some of it gets very confusing. If you read that Stephen Hawking guy, who made great contributions to the way we think about the universe and reality, he would say, well, you know, uh, things like, very confusing, well, every atom in this brush handle uh, travels every path in the universe to be where it is exactly. And you think, how is that impossible? It's unthinkable. But that's the type of thing he will tell you. And then you, and then you wonder about, well, what is the nature of reality then? If everything is moving all the time and every atom is taking every path in the universe to be where it at, is at any given time. And it's not the kind of thing that you recognize with your eyeballs. You only arrive at that conclusion through thinking and working out the mathematics and the physics of it all. So somehow, your brain interprets an image. Now, I've always put sort of color chips in my work because color has always interested me, perhaps a little more than other stuff. Let's say form. That's form. It has a very definite definition physically. You could draw a mathematical map of it all and measure it and, and decide on its perimeter and so on. That's a little bit different than color, which has another basis in physics because it's the breaking up of white light or sunlight. But I, I like the color. I find it very interesting for lots of reasons. So I always, in the beginning, put little blobs in my work. And when I, when I used to go out in the bush and paint scenery, I decided at some point when there was a lot of pollution going on that I would put little red dots and things like that in my work so that the, the landscape looked completely real except there were little red dots in it. It was up, up to people to figure out why were those little red dots there. They, they were sort of part of the composition because the painting still had to look good, but there was no given explanation. So then a person would appear in front of this image and see it as natural and real, but then have to wonder about the little red dots and maybe walk away from it and say, well, I don't know what that guy's doing. It looks kind of crazy to me which we all do at some point with artwork. I was just reading half an hour ago about a guy at an art show ate the banana that was on the wall, taped onto the wall with duct tape that had sold as a piece of modern art for 120,000 bucks. So, I mean, we all do sort of scratch our chin about that kind of thing and say, what on earth is going on there? What is the, what is the story? What is the meaning that we should take away from that artwork? Artwork is sometimes decorative, but often it has meanings for us all to think about that are a bit more intimate than just matching the couch. So when we look at this painting, number one, I'm testing out this business about how your brain 
decides what a thing is. So it may be difficult for you in looking at all this stuff to decide what on earth is that. Now, if I explained it to you, you'd know pretty well right away. But when I'm painting it, I, I don't do that. I, I don't want you to know right away. I want to see how your brain works and can it decipher what I put on there that is deliberately meant to mislead your brain. So I, I, can, I can have a section of it here. And it just looks like a bunch of blobs. Okay, if I take a small section like this piece up here, it is just a bunch of blobs. And I've deliberately changed the colors and changed the shapes and made it obscure so that it's very hard for you to decide what exactly is going on there. But it will be apparent if it is not already. It will be apparent when I finish discussing what I'm doing. So I take some time to design. The painting still has to look pretty in the end. It still has to have a balance. So you'll notice, you know, there's a bit of red here and a bit of red there and a bit of red there and a bit of red. It isn't all condensed in one place. I haven't got six green pieces right next to one another. I've spread it around so that there's a sort of rhythm and composition that is there just on the basis of color and design. So that actually, if people just wanted to hang it on their wall, it would be pretty. It might even match the couch. <laughs> but that's not what I'm doing. I'm breaking up certain images that are there into various blobs that just, if they're looked at singly, like this row of blobs here, they, they don't seem to mean anything. Or if we took just a quarter of the painting right here and said, what is that? It, it would be actually quite difficult to decide. So that's what I do. I, I sit down and design this. Sometimes I use my computer to lay out pieces and work out how am I going to do this and what colors should be used where and what shapes should be used where. It's sort of a synthesis of does this look okay until it all looks okay. And then it's a matter of putting it all down on the paper at the size that I need it and then painting it carefully so that it is blobs and the white is actually playing a part in as much as the blobs just sort of float apart. In fact, sometimes I think these images could be a whole series of floating blobs in three dimensional space. One of those things that when you're off to the side and all these blobs are floating at various angles, it doesn't really look like much until you come right in front of it and all the blobs line up and make this image. If I leave it there at that, it wouldn't be enough to explain the painting. In actual fact, I was preparing, as every artist's dream who studied anything about art history anyway to paint a reclining nude because it's been done throughout history and it's really difficult <laughs> and the decisions that have to be made to make it work are very trying what should the pose be how should the hands be placed? How should the feet be placed? Should the head be on an angle? Should the figure be smiling? Should it be revealing? Should it be obvious? Should it be demure? There are lots of questions to be answered there because the final product is what? What's it going to say? And if we look at the 
nudes, the reclining nudes or nudes throughout time, they do actually have something to say. I remember seeing one at the Art Gallery of Ontario, the lady with the green shoes. I've, I forget exactly, I'm terrible with names, just like a lot of people, and I just, at this instant right now, I can't remember the name of the artist. However, it struck me as this was sort of the beginning of feminism, when women were being included in a more recognizable way in the expression of artwork on this woman painting this nude uh, sort of said it all in a way here are women this is it in this case the model was posing at a school where i worked and uh I asked if I could take some reference photos with various poses that I thought I might want to do. And the answer was yes, I could, I could do that. And then in the middle of the discussion, the model's cell phone rang. And there she was answering her cell phone. And I thought, think no more. That is these times doesn't matter where you go today, people are on a cell phone. If I go to the beach and sit on the beach and do some painting, half of the people sitting on the beach are on their cell phones. You'd think they wouldn't be do that on the beach, but they are. They're on their cell phones. So you can go to the beach and see for yourself. So... When the young lady answered her cell phone, I thought that is perfect for this age and it's perfect subject matter for me. So I will use that random thing that seemed to say everything that needs to be said about the times. Now, the other thing about cell phones, of course, is that a lot of... Um, Dangerous stuff is going on with young people in terms of sending nude pictures and stuff like that. So in the end, I thought uh, that also said something about nudity today. And um, I did a number of paintings on variations on this. Now, if we look at it, what is this series of blobs here? Well, that's just an accoutrement to the model, which is over here. So maybe you'll be starting to search now and try to see the model. If I point it out to you, I'm sure you will see it in no time. For example, here is the head of the model. The model is sitting on a couch. One leg goes upwards and sits on a coffee table. And another leg comes towards the front and rests on the floor. There's a coffee table in here. And there's a flower pot in there and there's rulers and pencils or whatever it was at the time sticking out of the top of it this is the back of the couch i think this is the seat of the couch very hard to tell now because it's a few years since i painted it and this here would be the front of the couch or the floor there were bookcases in behind. I think there was even a TV on a shelf or a monitor for a computer. And then this over here was a very large pedestal pot of flowers. So here's the vase and here's the curved part here. And there's a whole bunch of flowers sticking out on the top like that 
Actually, I can't remember, but I may have added that myself to the composition just to finish it off the way I wanted. I, I Somehow I don't think that pot of flowers was there. I think I put it in because I like the idea of the pot of flowers. And it was something else to go in there for your brain to decide, what is that? And lastly, if you zoom in on this here, that is the cell phone. It is compositionally in a major dynamic spot. If we, if we go from the middle of the top here down to this corner, and we go diagonally from corner to corner here, we end up very close to be in a major dynamic spot right here, which is common to a lot of paintings. People think about composition and what the proportions should be between one place and another. If we went over here like this, we'd end up at the flower pot also sitting basically very close to a major dynamic. But here's the hand in here and the elbow going up here. And here's her chest in here. And here's her fingers on the other side of the cell phone there. And here's another finger underneath the cell phone supporting it, just like we do with our own phones when we're holding like this. So actually, if you stood in front of this painting and thought about it for a while, you could decipher what it was all by yourself. And I leave that for people to do with my other works that follow a similar format. So actually, the work is all about how does your mind work? How does it decipher an image? But it's approached from the same traditional points of view that create a good composition, nice color balance, and in the end, something that's beautiful and pretty, just like any other painting. And most artists would tell you an abstract painting follows exactly the same thing that a representational painting does. It still has lines, shapes, colors, rhythm, alternation, all those things that go into a normal representational painting are found in abstract paintings. What you see as something as representational is an illusion of reality. It isn't really reality. It's a two-dimensional, flat representation of reality, like looking out a window. It is no more real than the lines and the colors and the shapes that are all over here. So when you say, well, I don't understand abstract. If you're looking at a representational painting, it is actually abstraction in a representational format because it's duping you. It's making you think that reality is there. But in actual fact, it's no more real than this. Bye-bye.